Welcome to the latest episode of Griffin Manor. Now, in the last episode, I had set up a power production and distribution network in the very depths of the estate, and it was a uh, empowering experience. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, after I wrapped up the last episode, I found that I had made a huge mistake, but thankfully, I had discovered it early enough to keep the whole thing from crashing down on my head. If you remember, uh, I set up a source of coal production on the estate and I was using that coal to fire up the steam engines arranged around the workshop level to supply almost uh, half a million stress units to my power network. And yeah, I'm still pretty proud of that. Uh, however, the problem was that when I originally designed the plan, I had figured that each of the mining devices that actually produced the coal would feed 1.5 of the big boilers I had built, and since there were four boilers in total, I would only need three mining devices, and that would leave a little left over to build a surplus of coal. But that turned out to be wrong. Sorta. You see, I had to grab some coal for whatever reason, and when I went to check the coal storage, it looked to me like the amount of uh, surplus coal was actually going down. And after a few tests, it was confirmed. So uh, I was confused. But it was late, and I was tired, and so I did what any tired and lazy person would do in that situation, and simply added a fourth mining device. But uh, it turned out that it wasn't nearly enough. And then I realized that at one point in setting up the network, uh, I had overstressed it, and as a result, it blew away some of my cogs, uh, which I had been using to ramp up the RPMs and thus increase the production rate of the mining devices. And so, to temporarily reduce stress, I had removed uh, all the remaining cogs, which meant that the mining devices were then running much slower than they had been, and of course, much slower than I had originally planned or measured, and therefore, my mining devices were producing far less coal than I needed them to, uh, but I had never gone back and ramped the RPMs back up. After realizing my boneheaded mistake, and since I now had all the power production already in place, I, uh, I went back and instead of using COGS to ramp the RPMs back up, I installed a speed controller and cranked the speed to 256. Uh, now I'm able to feed all the steam engines with just a single mining device, and I still produce a sizable amount of surplus coal. Now, while uh, this is costing me almost 40,000 stress units of my power production, uh, which coincidentally is about 10% of my total power output, it is only a bit higher than what I was using at the slower speeds anyway, and my power production system is now beefy as hell. So I'm leaving it in the new config for now, and in fact, I rather like it this way. Uh, but of course, that's not what this episode is all about. So uh, today, I will start the renovation of the village of Andover, which lies southeast of the estate. Now, if you remember, in episode 7 of this series, I explained how vanilla Minecraft villages can be so oddly placed, designed, and generally boring, and thus why I plan to renovate the village of Andover into something more interesting and useful. Uh, and now it's time to make the first move in that direction. So in this episode, I will build the Rose and Crown Coaching Inn. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you know what an inn is, but I doubt that many of you really know the difference between an inn and a coaching inn. And that's probably understandable because they're a part of history and most people spent their time in history and science classes happily uh, passing notes, doodling, daydreaming, or outright dozing. Uh, we didn't really have coaching inns in this exact context here in North America. And while coaching inns still exist in Europe, uh, they are coaching inns in layout or history only as the stagecoaches have long since stopped running. So it's probably safe to assume that at least some folks will need a little primer on what a coaching inn actually is. And so you'll be able to understand what I'm trying to achieve here today. As the name might imply, coaching inns have something to do with coaches. Uh, not football coaches, but rather stage coaches to be exact. And when I say stage coach, most people, or at least almost everyone in the United States and Canada, will think of one of these running through some place like this. And that's actually pretty accurate. But it's actually only a small slice of the whole stage coach story. Uh, in fact, stage coaches are not an American invention. Uh, no, <laughs> they actually started in medieval England, but stagecoaches as we would recognize them today really started in the early 1600s. Basically, stage routes were the first land-based rapid transit systems in England. And when I say rapid, I mean that you could move from point A to point B at the mind-boggling speed of 4 or 5 miles an hour. 
That probably sounds incredibly slow to modern audiences, but it was actually pretty good when you remember that roads were rarely worthy of the name, and often not much more than a muddy track through sparsely populated lands that were frequented by highwaymen and um, maybe even highway women, and maybe the odd hostile beastie or two. So uh, riding the stage was not for the faint-hearted, but they were generally faster and better than most alternatives at the time. In the late 1600s, it would take a mere eight days to travel the 180 miles between London and Exeter. Uh, That works out to just 22.5 miles per day. Now, it might not be an exaggeration to point out that most folks in the modern world probably commute that far or further every day just to get to work or home, and uh, maybe even buy groceries. But by the mid-1700s, the roads, coaches, and landscape had improved to the point where stages were starting to run at a whopping 8 miles per hour. And by the time the first railroads were starting to appear, stagecoaches typically ran at a blistering 12 miles per hour. But while horses are powerful and truly magnificent creatures, they can't typically trot around at 12 miles per hour hauling a heavy wagon non-stop for hundreds of miles. Unless they were Odin's horse Sleipner, but uh, that kicks over a whole new anthill. So to maintain the higher speeds, there would naturally be need to swap out the tired horses with fresh and well-rested ones on a frequent basis. And that's where we get the stage and stagecoach. Uh, A stage route would be set up from point A to point B, and the route would be carefully divided into a number of segments or stages. Stages were usually between 10 and 15 miles long, and at the end of each stage, there would be a stage stop, usually a coaching inn. At the coaching inn, the horses would be swapped out, and while that was happening, the passengers would stretch their legs, grab a bite to eat, and maybe stay for a longer rest. At least that was the official intent. Uh, If there had been glossy, full-color travel brochures at the time, uh, that's probably what they would have depicted, and in many cases, the coaching inns were everything they were cracked up to be. But everything is not always rainbows and roses in real life, and there are plenty of horror stories about the food, the service, and the overall experience of the coaching inns. So uh, I won't go into those here, but I have put some links to some of that information on the page for this episode on my website, and the link is in the episode notes. <laughs> anyway, I needed to tell you all of that so that you would understand how and why the coaching ends were typically designed and built the way they were, uh, because that's what I'm going to build here, and so now you will, hopefully, understand uh, the method to my madness. Now, in general, the inn was designed as a building built around a central courtyard. Coaches would enter the courtyard through an arch in one or more sides of the building, and from the central courtyard, there would be access to stables and possibly a blacksmith. Um, Grooms and hostlers would rush out to swap out the horse team pulling the stage. However, the passengers would disembark, and there would be at least one entrance to the inn from the courtyard where they could find a dining room and other facilities to meet their needs. Now, uh, stages typically ran all day and all night, so the courtyard was a busy and noisy place around the clock. So having a room overlooking the courtyard was not a good idea if you wanted to get any real sleep, uh, just like staying in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. With uh, all of that in mind, I want to build the Rosen Crown to fit this model. Now, it will have the central courtyard, stables, dining room, common room, private rooms, and all the bits that go with supporting all of that. Uh, uh, but since this is a Minecraft and steampunkish world, we will kind of gloss over all the negative stuff and implement this to be the kinder, gentler, and more idyllic version of a coaching inn. Uh, if it helps at all, you can think of it as being disney So let me lay out the goals for this episode. The whole episode is about creating the inn, so yeah, that is definitely the primary goal. Um, Now, there is a reason why I started with the inn, and that's because the new village will completely replace the old village, and it would be much easier for me if I could just wipe out all the old village structures and essentially build from a clean slate. Uh, But if I wipe out the old village first, the folks that currently live there, um, i.e. the villagers, (laughs) will have no place to stay and will be subject to the effects of bad weather, hostile mobs, and the uh, curious and often hostile stares from passerby. So to prevent all of that, the inn will serve as a new home for all the villagers until I can get around to building uh, specific buildings and shops for each profession and some general residences for the locals. (laughs) Like I just said, uh, once the inn is up and running, I can and will go out and remove all the remaining bits of the old village. 
And there is a bit of complexity uh, in those last two goals in that the current landscape is a bit harsh and extreme. Uh, <laughs> not necessarily in terms of Minecraft, uh, where it's not uncommon to find sheer cliffs 60 meters high or floating stone mountains, but definitely in terms of the English countryside. So a fair bit of the effort in this episode will be spent in paring down the existing hillside to something more appropriate. Now, uh, I doubt I'll be able to do all the needed terraforming for the entire village in this episode, but the inn is going to definitely be a big building, so the foundation will require a fair bit of flat land, and there is a limited supply of that within what I consider uh, to be the limits of the future village of Andover, so I will need to make some of my own. Once the inn foundation is in place, I will have a gauge against which I can measure, plot, and basically lay out the whole village. Uh, though I still have a lot to do uh, in terms of planning to make sure I fully understand what I want to include in this village and what I'm willing to leave out. And with the village platted out, I could at least build out the initial road and street network, um, just like they do at real construction sites. As we can see here, the hills are a bit steep and high for what I envisioned, and since I know that the inn is going to be kind of large, uh, probably the largest building in the whole village, I need a fair bit of flat land. Uh, however, if I want to minimize the terraforming needed for this project, and I definitely prefer that, uh, my only real option is placing the inn a fair distance away from the hilltop, and that does not work so well for my overall village plan. So I will need to move the inn closer, and therefore I will need to suck it up and cut into the existing hill a bit earlier than I would normally prefer. When terraforming, I find it easier to grade the land using a kind of stair-step pattern, which allows me to run up and down instead of using ladders, scaffolding, or anything like that. Uh, it greatly speeds things up, and in most cases, that kind of configuration is a lot closer to the eventual shape of the land anyway, so it's not really a, a lot of extra work. Uh, it's also a lot safer in that it gives me options for movement should any hostile mob spawn or wander into the area because there is nothing worse than getting Zerg at the top of a tall cliff and having to decide whether to die in a heroic last stand at the top of the cliff, uh, from which it might be tricky to get my stuff back, or to die from the more practical but far less heroic rapid deceleration trauma at the bottom of the cliff. As I'm laying out this foundation, you might think that I'm making this up as I go along, uh, but if you've watched many of my videos, you probably know by now that I'm not. I am working against a plan that I drafted in Excel, and I originally laid out the plan using the modular system of all my builds, but in this case I used a smaller scale which is built upon uh, 5x5 blocks. Now normally I am forced to stick very closely to that grid because if I want to create the uh, open timber style of medieval buildings that I generally prefer, like the cottage currently located on the estate, I need to make sure that I had the right dimensions to ensure that I can alternate blocks of timber and filler, which is usually white concrete. However, I'm using the Dom Um Ornamentum mod, which, uh, as I pointed out in my recent mod deep dive video, the mod gives me a fantastic system for creating frame blocks, which allows me to achieve a superior open timber look and to achieve it at any scale and in any dimension. So I still use 5x5 modules for planning the overall uh, building footprint, but I'm not necessarily limited to sticking with that when the building, uh, the actual structure and interior spaces, though in many cases it still helps. Here's my plan for the ground floor of the inn. Uh, with this design, coaches would enter the central courtyard from the archway in the south wall. From the courtyard, there's access to the stables in the west, uh, the lobby and front desk to the southeast, and the common dining hall in the north. From those areas, passengers and guests can access the common sleeping room in the northwest. Uh, meanwhile, the innkeeper and his wife live in their quarters south of the lobby, the grooms and the hostler reside in the room south of the stables, and the kitchen staff live in the room south of the kitchen and east of the dining room. The upper floor, or first floor in British terms, is where the private rooms for the guests will be located. Now there are quite a few private rooms upstairs, and when combined with the staff quarters downstairs, uh, there are plenty of beds on the property, and so the inn should be able to house and support a sizable villager population, which is good as I do plan for a fair number of professions to be available in this village. Ha! <laughs> 
<laughs> and that brings up an interesting point. Um, as I've been working on building the inn, it has occurred to me that it seems incredibly quiet around here. Um, normally, I find that after a couple hours working on a village, the constant mm and ah of the villagers is driving me nuts. But that's not the case here, and out of curiosity, I decided to do a little ad hoc census of Andover. I was surprised to learn that at some point I have essentially lost the village of Andover. Or to be exact, I seem to have lost the population of the village of Andover. Now, I don't know how and I don't know why, but the entire population of the village seems to consist of just two village guards. And almost immediately after I figured that out, I witnessed a small pillager party reduce that by half. So the village of Andover is, for all intents and purposes, a ghost town. In checking the existing village buildings, I found uh, only two had beds. So the village had apparently not been that big to start with, and while there was a clay golem running around here originally, it looks like everyone, including the clay golem, uh, has been killed off or wandered away. Uh, <laughs> so I guess I have a new and immediate goal, and that is to repopulate Andover. And I don't necessarily relish that thought. Um, <laughs> when people want to say that a given task is hard, they describe it as difficult as herding cats. But I would gladly herd cats instead of herding Minecraft villagers. And that's probably intentional on the part of Mojang to prevent players from using villagers as a resource. Which is, quite frankly, exactly what I want to do. Some uh, tried and true methods of transporting villagers include the use of minecarts or rowboats both of which are a major pain in the butt on top of the difficulty of getting villagers into those vehicles without hurting them, uh, pissing them off, or drawing aggro from the local golem. <laughs> Fortunately, I have one advantage in that I have an airship courtesy of the Immersive Aircraft mod and it seats two. So if I can just coax a villager into the airship, I can be on my way. However, uh, this brings up a point that leads me to believe that the Minecraft game engine may in fact be inhabited by spirits and that I have somehow angered or annoyed these same spirits. Normally, if I leave my airship a little ways out of the village, I will invariably return to the airship to find one and sometimes two villagers sitting in it. And to get them out of my damn airship, I have to despawn the airship and then respawn it after they wander off so I can fly off in peace and by myself. However, now that I actually want one of those idiots to get in my airship, none of them will. Even if I plop down the damn airship right in front of them as they're walking. I could have sworn that at some point players could use leads on villagers and lead them around. Now, it's a distasteful idea, but it apparently doesn't really matter as it's not working in my world anyway. Uh, I could pull out my fishing rod and hook villagers and drag them around that way, but that counts as an attack and it's far less effective at controlling villager movement as the line snaps so easily. In an act of sheer desperation, I remembered that I had the Carry On mod installed, and that allows me to go pick up livestock and carry them uh, at the cost of some speed, uh, and then set them down again. But picking up livestock is one thing, picking up villagers is another. Uh, but like I said, I was desperate, and so I gave it a shot. And sure enough, it worked. So I was able to quickly abduct a couple of villagers and bring them back to the inn via airship. Uh, but then I ran into all new problems. Uh, for one thing, my villagers seemed to avoid using the beds from the Fantasy Furnitures mod. So I figured that there must be something wrong with the mod, and they only wanted to sleep in vanilla beds. So I spent an hour online to see if this was a known problem for this mod, or other modded beds in general, and it didn't seem to be. So I ran an experiment. I created some bunker-style buildings and filled them with vanilla beds and then picked up and ran each villager over a hundred blocks away and back, which should have reset their membership in the village and their assigned bed. I dropped them by the bunkers full of vanilla beds, which should have ensured that the pathing algorithm would uh, lock onto one of the closer vanilla beds, but they wouldn't use those either, uh, though they did hang out around these bunkers instead of hanging out in the inn. Uh, then I ran into another problem. Night fell, and I was missing a villager. Uh, there were no monsters nearby, and after sleeping in a bed myself and combing the local area in broad daylight, I could find no trace of the missing villager. So, uh, I went and kidnapped another villager from a nearby village, and that villager had a tendency to leave the village and wander away far at night. 
<laughs> so I brought him back to the inn, slept in a bed to reset the day, and then I carried him a hundred blocks out and a hundred blocks back, and while he would still not sleep in any beds, uh, at least that stopped his wandering from the village. But that finally brought me to the root problem. Um, I needed more villagers, and I couldn't keep abducting villagers from the surrounding villages, so I needed them to do the dirty deed and start being fruitful and multiplying. So I went back to the estate and I loaded myself up with emeralds and came back to the inn where I bought a few stacks of bread from the farmer and then I handed the bread to both villagers. They sucked up the loaves and then I waited. Uh, the villagers ignored each other for a while and then they hung out and chatted with each other for some time and then they did their own thing again and in looking at the villager breeding mechanics in the wiki, uh, they need to eat a certain amount of food and in this case simply eating three loaves of bread would do it uh, and to be together at the right time. But there's no mention or clue as to what the right time actually means. Uh, but the eating part seems straightforward enough. So I figured that if I could get them to eat a few times, they would be good to go. And I figured that if I could get uh, them a little hurt, they would eat to heal the damage. But I couldn't run around just slugging them to force them to eat. I needed something more subtle to prevent negative reputation. And then it occurred to me that I could pick them up and carry them. And since it's not a vanilla behavior, it would probably not generate negative reputation. So I tried an experiment. And yep, they took damage, and no, they didn't eat. Um, I had to stop the experiment out of fear of accidentally killing one or both of them. Uh, since they were no longer wandering off, I figured that I could leave them to it, and I would continue working on the inn, and so that's what I did. Now, several hours later, the inn is finished, and I still have just two regular non-guard villagers, and other than the fact that they are somehow fully healed, there's no change in their behavior, mood, or status, and there sure as hell no baby villagers running around bouncing on the beds. Now, I had read in a Reddit post that the villagers needed to be happy, so I spent a bunch more emeralds to buy all sorts of crap from them, and the belief that purchasing stuff from them would make them happy. Uh, no joy. So for now, I have two villagers in town and they're apparently not interested in going anywhere else. So I guess that's good enough for now. Uh, I will leave them be until the next time I'm working in town. Now as I write this, it has just occurred to me that I originally created this world with the female villagers mod, which adds female villagers and changes the breeding mechanics so you have to have one male and one female. But at one point, I had some crashes that seemed to be related to the female villagers mod, so I disabled the mod for a while, and that must have despawned all my female villagers. And even though the mod's been restored, the female villagers haven't been. So <laughs> I need to find a way to spawn new female villagers, or I'm going to have a real hard time populating my villages. It has been a bit of a teachable moment. And this is the finished inn. Uh, even as I look at it, I'm getting some ideas for possible additional details, but I think that I can safely say that version 1.0 is now complete. I have removed the original village buildings, so this is the entire village of Andover for now. Uh, I did move the village bell down here to where it'll better serve folks living in the inn, and uh, ditto for a couple of fields. Uh, with the fields full of wheat and potatoes, I think I will find and abduct a female villager, and this should give them everything they need to fill the inn. Uh, after all, there are more than 50 beds in this building, so unless modded beds don't count, I'm actually primed for a population explosion. Approaching the inn from the main road and entering the arch to the courtyard, you can see the overlooking rooms and hallways of the upper floor. Now, moving through the doorway in the north wall of the courtyard brings us to the dining room where guests can dine uh, on their favorite hearty rural fare and share tales of the road and adventure.
Immediately to the east of the dining room is the kitchen, uh, which is fully equipped with everything necessary to feed an inn full of hungry guests with whatever they might fancy, and uh, then some. At the north end of the kitchen, there are stone steps leading down to the cellar, where uh, the staff store some potent potables, some foodstuffs, and a genuine ice house with a drain in the floor to keep the melting ice from flooding the place. South of the kitchen is the hall between the lobby and the dining room, as well as the quarters of the kitchen staff, uh, the registration desk of the inn, and the quarters of the innkeeper and their family. Heading west from the dining room, one enters the common room. Uh, for those of limited resources, this is a place to rent a bed and grab some rest before continuing their journey. Of course, it's also a place where your stuff's more likely to get nicked by other travelers. Access to the upper floor and the private rooms are via the stairs in the northwest corner of the dining room. Uh, there are many clean, comfortable, and completely private rooms on this floor, as well as interesting views of the surrounding countryside. Uh, <laughs> I had originally planned to put sideboards in the halls and to place various decorations on the sideboards, uh, but I couldn't find anything quite narrow enough. So once everything was in place, it looked like some kind of crowded obstacle course. So I removed everything from the halls and I just carpeted it. I'm still thinking about hanging some paintings on the walls though. I had argued with myself in my head uh, about whether to add an additional floor. Now I eventually decided to compromise with a partial floor or attic if you prefer. Uh, I don't have anything up here at the moment, but I was thinking of maybe adding a bunch of typical um, attic junk, including um, armor stands, crates, barrels, chests, stuff like that.
And that completes this episode. Uh, the reboot of Andover is well underway. And while I think the inn is a smashing success, the, uh, the local population is a bit underwhelming. And if I'm being honest here, they are frustrating as hell. Uh, but then again, villagers have always been a major pain in the butt to regulate. And while we get new versions of the game with um, camels, sniffers, and armadillos, I guess we're just doomed to deal with villagers with the collective smarts of a uh, beach jellyfish. And it is what it is. Uh, but in the next episode, I will return to the estate where I will start filling the workshop with um, workstations and tools that will enable me to process the materials that I will need to continue reshaping this world into something that I hope uh, will be interesting to see and play in. And that reminds me, if you are interested in playing in this world, I've made the necessary files available on my website. Just follow the link in the episode notes and follow the vague and generally unhelpful directions on my page. Uh, I update these files with the release of each new episode so you can go in and explore this world in person uh, or at least as in-person as one can be in Minecraft. Uh, in the meanwhile, I hope this finds you and yours in good health, good spirits, and a touch of good fortune. Take care of yourselves out there. Cheers. <laughs>